Uh, fantastic to be here at Parliament this morning with Sue and Lloyd Clark from Small Steps for Hannah and Nadia Bromley from the Women's Legal Service. Yesterday, Parliament passed historic laws to better protect women and children experiencing domestic and family violence. I want to pay tribute to the hundreds of victim survivors who shared their story with the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force. We have listened, we have heard you, and we have acted. The bill that passed Parliament uh, late yesterday does a number of things, including amending the definition of domestic and family violence to better uh, protect women experiencing coercive control. It includes violence that happens over time, a pattern of abuse that happens over time. It's about identifying those red flags earlier before more blue police tape surrounds another family home. This bill also modernising, modernises the offence of unlawful stalking, which is so important because we know that it is underutilised, particularly when it happens in intimate partner relationships. We've broadened the definition to include intimidation, harassment and abuse, and it will better capture the technology that perpetrators are already using to track their victims and monitor their movements. And we're also doing so much more to ensure that the court system cannot be used by perpetrators to further control and abuse their victims. Things like ensuring that victims don't have to be cross-examined by their perpetrator in court and making sure the court really considers who is in most need of protection. We heard from the task force that so many victims were being misidentified as perpetrators uh, because the real perpetrator was manipulating and using the court process. This is all about making sure that women and children are safe, but when they come forward and they go through that court process, they are actually supported and not getting lost in the process. I also want to acknowledge that the stories that we've heard you know, from Sue and Lloyd about Hannah's story, uh, the story of Doreen Langham, it was two years ago yesterday that she tragically lost her life in my community of Logan. The families of the victims who are courageously sharing their stories are helping Queenslanders understand what coercive control is. You know, so many women have told me that before they heard the stories of Doreen Langham or Hannah Clark and so many others, they didn't realise they were in a domestic violence relationship. So thank you to everyone, the services, the victim survivors, the advocates who have made this a reality. I'm so proud uh, to be the minister to see this legislation pass through the House. I'll hand over now um, for some comments and then we'll take your questions. Hi everyone. Um, no one wants these laws more than our family. And um, when we look at it, we need to just take these small steps to get them uh, right and to make these laws stick. Uh, and we're happy enough the way it's going. And I think that this is something that needs to happen and to stop the scourge of domestic violence out there. Coercive control is such a complex matter, and that's why it needs to take time to get this right. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Yesterday, the House passed an important bill, and it was important for a number of reasons. It was important because its purpose was to better reflect our community's standards and expectations, to denounce behaviour that is not acceptable in our community, and to better protect Queenslanders largely Queensland women. It was also important because it was the first step in implementing the reforms from the Hear Her Voice reports, which were informed by the voices of thousands of Queensland women. This is a complex area of law and the work of this House is not done. And it will not be done until women are safe in their homes, in their relationships, on the streets and wherever they choose to go. But the fact that the work of this House has been occupied by all sides of politics in the last two days committing to addressing family and domestic violence is worth celebrating of itself. This is the first of many laws we need to see to improve the safety of women in our state. And it is an encouraging sight to see that we have seen these reforms implemented, but it's important to remember that this law and the others that follow it are not perfect and will not be. A feature of our democracy is constant participation, scrutiny and feedback and improvement. And I am sure the government will welcome the entire community in the way it chooses to engage with it, to provide scrutiny and oversight and to ensure that we continuously improve. 
The work of the House this week is an important step in that journey of our shared commitment to creating safer futures for women and children. Thank you. I think by having very clearly in the definition of what is domestic and family violence, abuse that occurs over time, that pattern of abuse that occurs over time will mean that our system is much better set up to respond to coercive control. At the moment, really, our system is set up to respond to one individual incident of physical violence. And that is not how domestic and family violence is experienced by so many victims. Of course, as part of this, there will be extensive training for our first responders, such as police, but also our domestic and family violence services. And most importantly, for Queenslanders to have the language to understand that they are experiencing domestic and family violence and they can come forward and seek help. You know, I know that we've heard from many of Hannah's friends and they knew what was happening was dangerous, but they didn't have the language to go to police and, and make sure that there was action. I think because of the stories that are now being shared by so many tremendous advocates, Queenslanders are beginning to understand what coercive control is and the government has now acted to make sure that's very clearly in our laws. One of the key recommendations from the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force was to update the curriculum for respectful relationships to be rolled out in every one of our schools. We have to start with young people if we're going to break that cycle of violence. Um, I know Sue has done some amazing work with Beyond DV in, in some of the local schools working with young women and their, and their mums to talk about what are the red flags when you start uh, to be in intimate partner relationships that you can identify this controlling behaviour. Making sure we start with young people to really tackle what underpins that cycle of violence, that disrespect, is going to be critical if we're going to eliminate this violence from our communities. Yeah. Well, we think it's very important for the education of children as young as possible. Just uh, coercive control even goes on in the playground between friends with I'm not playing with you today or you can't be their friend if you're playing with me. Things like that which we don't realise is coercive control. So respectful relationships need to be taught from early ages to everybody. Yeah, and, um like Sue said, it, it's got to start and it's starting now, so uh, we'll find a whole rollout, I'd say, by a term to this year, hopefully. Um, we are working in with um, the Redlands Council and we're going to start doing some uh, talking to the schools down there uh, about better behaviour in relationships. And most importantly, we need to look at how to break up respectively. And I think that's what we all need to learn and to actually not be bystanders anymore, stand up and you see something and say something. And that's about all the community getting on board with that. So do you think that um, by standing here today, you will hopefully give confidence to men and women that are in this situation that's very similar to what happens here? Do you think that's another thing that we'd like to achieve? Certainly would. We would certainly love to let everyone know that they're validated. We hear them and please come forward if you're suffering any of these experiences and also we want to put it out there to friends and family to look out for these red flags and to be there for family members or speak up to a family member or friend who you may think is perpetrating these. That would be our goal, to Most have definitely. it Australia-wide. Yeah, it's got to go nationally. I don't think there's anything wrong with waiting and watching and learning to see if there are any mistakes, but I like to think Queensland will get it right.
It's emotional. <laughs> Very emotional. It's been an emotional week, been an emotional couple of weeks. Um, it hasn't been getting any easier. Uh, it seems to be getting tougher each year. Um, but we're hoping that maybe these, the law can actually be passed uh, in time for Hannah's um, heavenly birthday on September this year. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> And I think we need extensive training for the police. They're doing the best they can, but coercive control is not easy to understand. And I think the more training, the more obvious these signs will be to the police. They have a lot on their plates and we need to have the laws there so that they can do something about it when they see it happening. Well, I have got the three-day initial training started and then more advanced uh, officers and that then can go do a five-day one-on-one -on -one training. So it's not over the computer, that it's actually face-to-face, -face, which is, uh, I think, more validated that way as well. Yeah, so we've released those nationally consistent principles around coercive control, which was a great effort um, from attorneys general right across the state. Everyone is looking to Queensland, particularly, you know, the work that we did with the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force chaired by Margaret McMurdo. I know the clerks are actually travelling to South Australia um, later this year. They told me um, to work with the South Australian government. I've met with many of my counterparts who are very interested in what Queensland is doing here. We are taking the time to get it right. We do have the benefit of looking overseas at a handful of other jurisdictions, but we know we have to get our systems, our training done before this becomes a crime because we don't want to see unintended consequences. But the laws that passed yesterday are a fantastic first step in making sure we can better protect Queenslanders. Well, I think when it comes to you know, the criminal law, we do like to try and see um, consistency, but because this is a relatively new concept as part of our laws, we all want to work together to make sure um, that we do have those consistent approaches across jurisdictions. You know, we, we really do try where we can to make sure we've got that consistency. And of course, there's other parts in this bill um, that really do bring Queensland into line with other jurisdictions, particularly around the naming of offences. So where we can, we try and be consistent. Yeah, I do. And I think that they've really now, they have a roadmap to actually get this right. You know, we initially laid out $100 million for some of those really key critical training initiatives. Um, we have the tools that we need now to make sure that we can intervene earlier, better respond to red flags. And I do have confidence that the leadership of the police are with us on this journey. Sure. Uh, so I understand that the Queensland Police are working very closely with the Commonwealth to ensure a timely um, extradition and I understand the police will be making themselves available later today to give more detailed updates. Absolutely. We want to hold perpetrators to account and I think it, there has been tremendous amount of work done uh, by the police uh, to bring back this perpetrator. Uh, to face you know, the justice system here in Queensland. Yeah, look, I understand our child safety workers work incredibly hard. I know, um, you know over the last you know, eight years we've seen a reduction in caseloads from 21 down to 16, but there is always more work to do. And, you know, because of the prevalence of ICE, domestic and family violence, mental health, um, drug and alcohol abuse, the cases that our child safety workers are working in are becoming more complex. So we have to support them. I know there is a huge amount of work underway in the Department of Child Safety and we will continue to support those workers.
Look, I mean, we had a commission of inquiry not all that long ago, which recommended a completely changing the way we support families and, you know, having early intervention. We've set up all of these support services. You know, clearly we have reviews when these tragic events happen and we learn from it. I know that the Department of Child Safety has already accepted all of the recommendations from that review and are building that in to their practice. Um, so we do review these cases and we do learn from it and that you know will hopefully be the legacy of this tragic case. Uh, you'd have to check with the Minister but as far as I know that, that work is underway. And of course don't forget you know, before um, an intervention with parental agreement um, can be agreed to, you know, there is um, drug and alcohol testing that now takes place as a result because we've seen this explosion of ice in our communities and we know that that often, not always, but often can lead, you know, to the neglect of children. So making sure that there is really strong drug testing in place is one of those key reforms. Uh, so um, obviously we're working through the recommendations from the Goddison report and there'll be further legislation to be introduced in the parliament to reform casino regulation. Um, I've also met um, with the special manager um, and I'm keeping abreast of their work. There's a lot of work that's already been underway um, in terms of making sure that STAR can reach suitability by the deadline later this year. So all attorneys general have supported the bringing forward of a proposal um, to look at raising the age to 12. So that work is underway. I know WA and the Commonwealth are leading that work and there'll be discussions later this year as a group of attorneys general to look at that proposal. We've been pretty consistent that we would like a nationally consistent approach when it comes to young people. Um, and you know, as we've seen this week, there is a huge injection into funds to really get in earlier, you know, to work with the young siblings of young people who are in the system to make sure we're supporting them so they don't end up in the youth justice system. We do have to do more around early intervention and prevention with these young people, um, and that's what we're committed to doing. Look, the human rights legislation contemplates an override in exceptional circumstances. We've seen in Victoria, who have had the Human Rights Act in place for longer than Queensland, they had to override their human rights when it came to prisoners. It is contemplated by the legislation. We have acted to keep the community safe. Um, and as I said, that huge injection in early intervention and prevention is what will inevitably keep the community safe. But there does have to be consequences for young people who do the wrong thing. We acknowledge that Queenslanders are scared um, and we have made that decision because of the exceptional circumstances that we're seeing play out in our streets um, to introduce those laws. So there's obviously been a lot of discussions and a lot of work to see what more we can do to intervene earlier to stop this offending that we're seeing play out on our streets. So there has been numerous discussions. Cabinet landed a policy position on Monday and those laws were introduced on Tuesday. Yeah. Look, we, certainly, particularly as the Attorney General, we do not override the Human Rights Act lightly. There has been an enormous amount of work done and legal advice about how we get the balance right between community safety, you know, Queenslanders have a right to feel safe in their communities. I mean, we have seen incredible escalation of violence, particularly with the weapons that are now being used. We have to get that balance right with actually doing what will best keep the community safe by intervening earlier with these kids. So, you know, we've got that advice. We have not made that decision to override uh, the Human Rights Act lightly. That serious repeat offender declaration is so that the courts have more discretion to be able to deal with these children that are not responding 
to the interventions that other young people are responding to. So we have to step up our game and intervene earlier with these serious repeat offenders. So, you know, we're never going to override the Human Rights Act lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.